Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Before we dive into the exciting journey of real estate data engineering, I want to give a big shout out to Bright Data for sponsoring this video. Their web scraper, proxy manager, and proxy rotation has been really instrumental and pivotal that is changing the way we access the data online and analyzing web data. Bright Data offers a comprehensive suite of tools that is designed for maximum control and efficiency in web data collection. There is a residential proxy, ISP proxies, data center proxies, even mobile proxies. And something that, I, that interests me the most is rotating proxy, uh, where you can rotate the IP addresses while web scraping or accessing a particular website. They have scraping browser and web unlocker as well. And they have a tons of data set and data marketplace where you can buy data set from. They are supporting over 20,000 customers worldwide and you have all of this at your fingertips use a variety of programming languages to access all of their services they are also very compliant to gdpr ccpa and iso certified whether you are an e-commerce seo market research or any field that relies on up-to-date data bright data offers a solution that is tailored to your needs their tools are not just powerful but also user friendly and you can focus on what really matters by making informed decisions based on accurate data. Now, let's take a look at the architecture of the system we are going to be building today. We have a real estate website that has all the information about real estate, buying houses, renting and stuff like that on their website. Then we are going to be using Web Scraper, Bright Data Web Scraper, to be collecting information from this website using Python. And we're going to be leveraging large language model, something like ChatGPT in this case, once the data is coming in from there, we're going to stream the, uh, the data directly into Kafka, which is managed by Zookeeper. We can visualize that on the UI with the control center, as well as uh, maybe on the terminal as well, if you like. Now, once the data gets into Kafka, we're going to have a master worker architecture in this case, where you have the Spark master collecting information from Kafka and distributing it to the workers in this case. Now, each of these workers are going to be processing this and aggregating them and doing all other things and storing the data into Cassandra. That is the architecture of the system we're going to be building today end to end. We're going to start with the collection of data from here and eventually getting this uh, into Cassandra. Now, before you continue, you need to have a, an account on Bright Data. So you can get that by going into brightdata.com and you can sign up. So I'm going to just uh, log into my account once you do the sign up. Uh, okay, good. So if you don't have an account, you can quickly sign up here and you should be good to go. If you use the link in the description below, you have access to $10 when signing up that you can use to run this project and also use the rest to access any other website for free online. So basically, I'm going to be selecting the log login with Google and I'm going to continue from there. So login with Google and uh, yeah. Uh, lovely. So we are going to be in the dashboard. Now in my dashboard, if you look at the dashboard, I have my proxies here. The first one here, if you click on this, you have the zones. Basically this guy is going to go to zones, uh, which you can see your inside your zone, you see your proxy in here. So this is my proxy and I have one called Zoopla Scraper. So I'm going to delete this one and create a new one. So just, we can, we can easily follow through the process from start. So I just click on hard and uh, create, on, create a new scraping browser. So this scraping browser is an all in one browser that includes built in unlocking capabilities with along with proxies to unlock websites at scale without being blocked. Okay, so I'll just click on uh, the scraping browser. And I'll call this one real estate, real estate scraper. I'll call it browser. Yeah, I prefer the word browser in this case. Okay, good. Um, so there's no need to have a custom headers in here, but if you want to, you can have a custom header in this case, and this will be the headers that will be sent along by the time it's trying to access the website. Okay, so if you click on add, yes, I'm going to be adding this. Now you can see the session time per hour and then the traffic cost, okay, per gig. Good. So once this is done, you have access to the host information, which is going to be the the uh, the host that you, get, you are going to be adding to your uh, whatever it is you want to use to scrape the 
the website and the username in here the, the password as well goes here okay um so once this is done the next thing you want to do is check out some of the code examples you can come in here and uh, open this in a new tab and in this new tab you see the api here that's going to get you started so you can use any of these uh, libraries that is here and any other language here so you have node.js python and c sharp in this case so i'm going to be selecting python for my case and you can use playwright or use uh, puppeteer or you use uh, selenium uh, regardless of whichever one you, you decide to use so yes i'll be selecting uh the selenium in my own case right uh but if you like you can also select playwright maybe we should even use playwright in our case okay good so what we can do basically is to just uh copy this all right uh we're going to copy this and uh since this is node.js we're going to change this to python and uh, yeah, there's Scrappy, Playwright, there's Selenium as well. So I'll just stick to uh, Playwright in my case, okay? Uh, stick to that. And you can see the installation requirements here and how you can just get started. All of these are populated for you based on the accounts you are using to, to log in. Now, good. Now, the next thing you want to do, once this is set up properly and you can do that, you have access to create a new project. So the next thing you want to do is create a new project. I'm going to call this new project here. I'll call it, uh, the name of the project is going to be real estate, real estate data engineer, engineering, okay? And the folder is going to be maybe real estate. I'll call the, the folder name real estate, good. And I'm going to be creating a main of py and then create new project and uh, we should be good now the project is created for us by the way i'm using pycharm but you can use any other ide that you uh, you like something like a uh, vs code or any other id that you prefer so but i'll be using uh, pycharm in my case now the next thing you want to do is confirm where your python is running from because python is already on your local system and by the, by the time you create a virtual environment you are going to have a python inside your venv so you can check that and double check to confirm that everything is working as, as expected by typing which python now okay you can see that everything is inside here uh, inside my folder and inside real estate data engineering and i have my python inside the venv so this is exactly what i want and this is the right thing to do good now finally the next thing you want to do is copy this and uh, do the installation that we want so the installation in our case is going to be the this uh this uh, mo the most simple one here just to get this and test if the code is working as expected i'm not going to be using pip3 i already have it installed on my system i'll just uh, install playwright directly and this is installed so let's take let's take this for a spin and copy this if i copy this and come back into my main.py and paste it in here we should be seeing all of this so you can see that i have my sbrwcdp here which is the the scraping browser uh, credentials here okay good and finally you can see i think this is the password let's double check that and if you go back in here the password is g something something yeah exactly so that's that's it so you have the the cdp and the credentials here up, up here so the next thing you want to do is get in your base url so the base url is going to be in my case uh just turn off my auto completion and we should be good okay so i'm going to have https and the, the website is zoopla.co.uk good now once i have this i'm going to have it i'm going to need a location as well uh which we're going to get to shortly so the location i'm going to be scraping in my case is going to be london so i'm going to be looking for a house in london to buy okay good so the next thing is just to get us uh let's change this uh connected navigating to we just navigate to okay we have, um, we're navigating to location uh rather base url okay base url we're navigating to the base url in our case and we're going to the base url go to base url okay base url all right good all right so before we we run the code and all that we need to look at how the website looks like okay 
So if I copy this and we go to the website and I open a new tab here and I go in here. So this is the first page you're going to see and this is the landing page, which is good. So if you type in in here for sale, we are looking for sale. We want to buy a house. All right. So in this case, if you type in London and you press enter key, you'll be able to see something like this right and you can see the guided price of nine hundred thousand uh, pounds for a three bedroom uh apartment yep and you can see something like 270k in here so these are the kind of things we are going to be getting we're also going to be extracting something like the freehold and stuff like that so if you click on something like uh, the 900k for the three bedroom apartment you see that uh, this is something like this and uh, it's in southfield here three bedroom three bathroom two receptions epc rating the tenure and stuff like that these are uh, relevant information for us you can also extract something like this in case you want to catch up on that okay so and uh yeah even you can get something like uh, the mortgage calculator but we're not we don't need that we only need only the thing we, we need in this case are the maybe a picture of the house and the apartment the price some of this information to see what is available in there then the tenure will be interesting as well to get uh once we get that we are going to get something like maybe something from here as well but but that's uh that's on the high side but that, yeah i think you have an idea of what we're trying to to do in this case good now we can now go back to our terminal to see if everything is working as expected and we can take this uh our credentials for a uh, spin right so there's no need to do all this so if you by the way if you have if you have a capture that you're expecting something like the capture that you need to solve so you just need to do uh on comment this part if you on comment this part you'll be able to solve the capture and that would uh, give you additional uh, level of benefit this is this are one of the advantages of using that but I'm, i don't need that really for now i'll just uh maybe remove this uh in my case good so let's just run this, take this for a spin and see if everything is working as expected. I just say python main.py and let's see what we have. Are we able to connect to the scripting browser? Yeah, beautiful. So it's uh, connected and now it's navigating to zoopla.co.uk. So it's going to extract the HTML for us and you can see everything is working just fine, including the styling and all that. Good. So we don't need all of that. I just want to show you that this is uh, accessing that and now we can now get the information we want. Now, before we continue, it is important you don't overwhelm the Zoopla browser, uh, even though it is taken care of automatically by Bright Data, but you still want to make sure that whatever information you are getting is on a, is, uh, on a more specific basis. You don't just scrape the entire web browser and the entire browser and say you want to dump the entire com uh, the website okay so you just extract the things you want maybe for the information and analysis purposes just for research purposes and educational content okay so that's that's that about that then we can now go through the website in detail and now extract the information that we need so the very first information we need is going to be the the name of course we are going to be needing the name in this case, something like the three bedroom masonette for sale, the location, some of the, if we, if we want, we can get the address as well, but we want to get something like the leasehold and uh, something like that. So if you like the apartment, you have a link in there that you can click on and get the, the information of the agent and you can reach out and buy from there. And that's what uh, the plan is. So let's continue on our code, uh, in our code and we, we fine tune this to make this uh, better. All right, so we are able to connect to the browser here, which is a good thing. I'm going to just uh, space this up. And the next thing is going to the page, which is good. And inside the first page, in the front page here, which is uh, where we typed in London. So that's where we're going to be going back in. So we have uh, London in here. We go in here. So let's fill in the, the London into the, into the, text box and we can now continue so we say uh what we want to do basically is to enter london in the search bar and then we press enter just like we i demonstrated to you to search for the apartment in london so what we do is basically await our page.fill and then you have the input information in this case which is uh 
inspect if you inspect this you have the input information as uh, let's see what you have here yeah the input is going to be something like uh, auto suggest input all right that's the id in this case and there's a name auto suggest input so yeah uh, we can get the name in this case for that i'll just uh, maybe uh, copy the auto suggest input copy that and then come back here and pull the information from there okay so i have the page fill here i'm going to be filling the input because it's an input tag all right input tag isn't it yeah input tag and then inside the input tag we're going to be getting the name in this case that will be the name it's going to be auto suggest input so that will be something like this all right so once we do that we pass in the location and that will be our location uh, location and that will be london in our case all right uh not lo it's london yeah good uh this will be comma and we should be good uh we close this tag as well yeah impute name auto suggest impute and we pass in london into that so then the, what we want to do basically is uh, we, we press enter so we say uh wait page dot keyboard dot press and then we press the enter key once that is done uh, let's quickly log something here uh, i like print but we can use the login as well so we say print um waiting for search result isn't it search results okay good now we can assume we typed in london in here and press enter we are in the next page which is this page that we are navigating into right now so what we want to do basically is now look through each of these records and fetch the information from there as efficient as possible so uh just put this here okay then we will do await uh, page dot wait for load state all right so we are waiting for the page to load so once the page loads and you you press enter you wait for the page to load then you start extracting the content in this case now you don't need to extract everything in this case we just need this some part of the website to extract information from and if i do uh, a right click here and i do inspect and you should see something like this uh, if i scroll up a little bit so this part of the system is where we want to fetch information from uh, we don't need the top here we just this section yeah i think is this div now in this div you can see we have featured listing and we have regular listings as well so we don't need this featured we start from this regular which is something that starts from regular here so anything you want to fetch is going to be in this box and you can see everything is uh, outlined uh, pretty nicely here you can now fetch information from there good so we just uh, focus on this regular listing part which is the data test id here i just go back in here and then once the page loads i'm going to have a content here and uh, content is going to be a width uh we say page dot uh inner html and which inner html do we want we need the div and we just get in the uh okay data let's see data test id which is that data dash test id equals to this as our regular listing good and uh, yeah so that will give us this content everything in here so what we want to do basically is look through everything that we have in here all right so we have all of this are in the same class and we can fetch all of their information from there good so we have the content right now we can assume even though we still don't have it yet but we can assume we have the page content in our div right now uh the next thing we want to do is now pass that so for that we need to bring in a library called beautiful soup so we say pip install bs4 so if you do pip install bs4 then we can now import bs4 here we say from bs4 import beautiful soup a soup that is beautiful good now we have our soup in here which is going to be beautiful soup and then we pass in the content and the parser library that we want to use so which is the html dot parser in our case all right so we have our parser that is going to be passing the content of this uh, page 
in this case. All right, so that will give us access to all of the content and we can now uh, find information from there. So which is uh, what we want to find basically is this class that has all of these items uh, in them, which is the DKR2TH2, right? So we come back in here and we say for, uh, we just enumerate. So basically we say enumerate and we say soup dot find find all find underscore all and then we pass in our div which is what we were looking for in here a div that has a class of dkr2th2 right so the class uh, it, comma then the class in our case the class class underscore is going to be uh let's copy that i'll just copy this and go back here and paste it in here good so that's a uh, enumerate and by default you should understand that enumerate give us access to the index and the, as well as the the value which is the idx and uh, our div in here okay so that gives us access to that and uh, we should be good to go uh, from here so we have an an index that we can work with and as well as the div all right so let's start extracting our data so our data in this case is going to be coming here but we need to get a price Okay, I'll just put this as price. We need to get the title. The title is going to be sitting there. Maybe the link, of course, is going to be uh, maybe div, and then we find the h8 anchor tag in this case, of course. That's where the link is usually sitting in. All right, so we extract the href from there. So these are the uh, four things, uh, the three things we want to extract and put into our, our data for now. And then let's start extracting them. Okay, uh, I don't know exactly where this is going to be. I just assume this. So let's check on the price level. So if you come in here and to the first one, uh, which is this 900K, if you come down here to see what you have, uh, you can see that on this side of the screen, this is the image. And on this other side, you have the, the div that has the price, isn't it? And here you can just come in here. You see the... The, we don't need that we don't need this we just go down here and uh, go drill down a little bit more this is just done one so you don't have to do it every time okay so you come in here you can see there's a particular div in here called uh this name yeah and you can see the guide price and interestingly there's a data test id called listing price the listing price is having a data test id so this is good we can use this to extract the price in this case okay and uh, let's see and we we also have the address as well uh yeah so we have the we have the price from there we have the title interestingly we have the title yeah listing title good and we have the what else do we have here we have the address we have yeah, there's, an, there's a particular section, uh, a tag called address in this case. Okay, so let's start getting that from there. So we have the the address. Um, that would be div.find. And then we just get our address in this case, address.txt. All right. Then we have the price. Oh, yeah. I just changed that. So there will be div.find. And then we are looking for... We are looking for the price in the data test ID of listing price, isn't it? So, okay, maybe we should leave price for now. Let's just uh, continue with the rest. We will fetch the price much later. So we have the title, then we have the, the div for the title here. We find the H2 tag, isn't it? Uh, the title here is the H2, yeah? exactly the listing title yeah that's what we're looking for so we just find in the h2 and then we extract the dot text from here the link as well is going to be coming in from the anchor tag as well good so let's see if that works just fine and we just say data.update and we pass in the address uh sorry address and that would be the the address in this case uh we say comma we pass in the title yeah this is supposed to be a json isn't it yeah title and then we pass in the title here the link as well um 
we have the base URL, of course, which is the Zoopla stuff, and then um, plus the link. Okay. Uh, so let's see how that looks like. If you just uh, print this, uh, just uh, brick, and then uh, you print the data that you have here, and let's see how that looks like. So if I run this again, and uh, i just want to get the first item in this uh, location so we are going to we're navigating to zoopla.co.uk now and it says there's an unexpected error while passing this so there's an error when passing the regular listing so you we didn't close the tag here it should be div data test id then you close the tag okay and then we go again Okay, it's so navigating to Zoopla now and uh, waiting for search result. Okay, beautiful. And uh, you can see uh, the data that we have. Interesting. So uh, if we go up a little bit, so uh, we're still printing the HTML. That's why you see that long, uh, long output. That actually brought down uh you know clear that out so we just need to run this again i'll just clear this out and run that again so we can see our data uh i wasn't expecting this before so because i forgot to do that okay so it's navigating to zoopla now Okay, so we're waiting for search results. And you can see in the address, we have the Southfield Road in Chiswick and the title and the link, which is good. So this means that we were able to fetch all of this, uh, these three records from here. Now, once we have the link, we can get to the, to the listing page to get the full details. And here is where we do all the major extractions and the information we really need. Uh, everything we could uh, probably need uh they are all here okay so including the the images as well okay so let's see how that goes and then let's start the extraction all right so going back here um maybe i can just put this uh instead of uh, putting that there i can put this like this the title and the link as well would be this all right and i can maybe remove that Okay, and by the way, this is the first record, so I'll just uh, change this to that. Yep, I'll close this up, and that should fix it. Good. Now we have our data in there sitting pretty nicely. So we now want to navigate to the next page, all right, which is the, the, the listing itself, the listing page. So we are going to go to the listing page all right so for us to go to the listing page we need to navigate so let's say we say navigating to the listing page which is this uh, particular link uh in this link all right uh yeah i think maybe we might need to do something like so we don't have to repeat the same tag over and over again so that's the link that we're going to so we have uh, a wait in this case, of course, a wait page dot go to, and we have the base URL, the base URL plus the link, which is where we're going into here, uh, link. Okay, that's the page we're going into, or you just say data in this case, so we don't repeat this. So we say data, and then we extract the link from there. Okay. So we are going to this particular page, and once the page loads, we just need to wait for it to load. I wait page dot wait for load state, and we can get in the load uh, load state in that case to extract uh, to wait for the content to load. All right. So once that is done, we have our content here, and then we can now start getting information from there, which is the inner HTML. Inner HTML from here is going to be if you check the inspect again, and uh, we come back to this. And I just do, I'll just scroll up a little bit and uh, inspect. Okay. 
and this is the listing page and you can see in the listing page we have uh this is the entire listing page uh, the section here but we don't need the entire section we just need this listing page but one part of the section which is this uh we don't need the breadcrumbs let's see yeah where are the breadcrumbs everything is uh we just come back here where are you yeah this one and then we go in here to the, yeah you can see each sections are divided here so this is where we do the major work of uh heavy, heavy lifting from here so we get the gallery heading which is the pictures all the pictures are here and then we get all of that information from here but everything is inside the listing uh details page so that's what we want to do so we just get the inner html in that case we are getting the div that has a test in fact let me just copy this i uh, just copy this and uh, copy from here to here and we are getting the div that has a test id which is the data test id uh, for this i'll just put this as a single quote uh, this has a, uh, a div that has a test id of listing details page and i'll just close that tag so we don't make the same mistake just like we did before so this is the div data test id good so that will give us all the content in that case so we need to now use the same thing we don't need this the previous soup anymore so we can always overwrite that so i can have a beautiful beautiful soup all right and then we pass in the content and uh, of course the html dot parser by the way you can use other parsers as well if you are if you prefer okay so yeah so let's get the pictures first okay and we can handle all of the pictures extractions so we have the pictures so the pictures uh let's say this is the picture section okay and that would be we are looking for soup.find in this case we are looking for a section just like we checked in here uh, we have a, a picture if i just point to this we can see we have uh, in this case we have a section called listing gallery heading so i'll just copy that in this section i'm going to be copying and coming back to area labeled by i'm looking for area labeled by and uh, in this json i'll be passing the listing gallery heading into that so what that means is find me a section that has this attribute of area label by and this value of listing gallery heading so this will be the pictures that we are going to be extracting and we need to have a function that does the extraction for us so extract picture and we're going to be passing the picture section in there now how do we extract this picture so we need to have a simple function maybe just above here to say dev extract uh, picture in this here we have a picture section the picture section and in the picture section we're going to have all the picture sources that we want to use so picture sources is going to be this now for picture in the picture section isn't it we are trying to find all so what happens is this is going to return a list of pictures for us gallery slide 11 to maybe zero or something like that uh yeah uh okay we have zero to 10 and so everything is 21 pictures in this case and that's exactly uh 22 yeah zero to 21 so that's 22 yeah <laughs> so we have 22 pictures in this case lovely pictures and lovely house in this case so we just need to find all of that and what we are looking for basically is this picture the picture tag where we can see all of this information from there good so we just find in picture and once we find it once we find the picture in this picture we are looking for the source set which are the sources in here so we say for source in the picture dot find all so we are looking for source okay this tag we are looking for this source one two three four right and there's an image as well but usually if you look at this image there is nothing in here we only have sources which are going to be 
determined by the CSS to, to know the, the width and all that. So you can leave that. So we're looking for the sources in here. Okay. And each of the sources have multiple uh, uh, pictures, right? So in the source, we have a, if you look at the source, we have the source set, we have the source type, we have the media. Those are the three things that are there, right? So we can come in here to say uh, source type which is going to be, we need to get that. So we say source.get and we get the type from there. Exactly. This is what we're extracting from here. So we extract the type. And uh, if we don't get that, we, we default it to empty and then we split uh, by this and we just get the last record here, minus one. Okay. And what I'm doing basically is to, to get the WP, uh, web P here. All right, so this picture is in WebP format, so I can just get the WebP. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm getting this type and I'm splitting by forward slash and getting the w or WebP from there, okay? Then for the picture URL, uh, which is the pick URL, I can say source.get and I'm getting the source set, all right? And if I don't see that, I default to empty and I split that to by uh, comma, just like we have the picture here, one, two. So I get that, uh, split that by, uh, by comma and I get the first one. Then I split that by space and I extract the zero item. So what that means is basically I come in here, split this up. And if you look at this here, I can see, you can see the image here is like this and I'm, I'm, I'm extracting the first record in here. So I don't need the second two times in here. That's what that means. Okay. All right. So once that is done, finally, we just say if the source type, uh, the source type equals to a P, which is what we, what we want. And uh, 1024. If you look at this, what I want to do is extract the highest uh, highest picture, which is this one here. So I want to extract this part, uh, the one with uh, 1024 uh, dimension. All right. So 124, 1024 in the picture URL, in the peak URL. So I just say picture sources that append the peak URL. I think you get the point. So I'm extracting only the 1024 images. I don't need the lower versions of that. And uh, yeah, that should be it. I just return picture sources. Good. And that would give us the picture. And we can use this to update our data in this case. So if you just, add, just like you are indexing uh, this particular uh, guy here, you just come down here, we say data. Uh, for the pictures is going to be pictures and you say uh, pictures good and that should uh, be good we should have the address title link and pictures okay so let's run this and see if everything is working just fine before we continue and extract the other information that we need so we are navigating to zoopla now to fetch that for from the page and let's see if everything is working just fine so we need to navigate to london all right waiting for search results good and um, we are navigating to the listing page now all right good and let's start extracting lovely and you can see all of the pictures are scraped from here and you can see in this uh in this address, we have the address here, and these are the pictures. Interestingly, you can see this fetch 1024, 1024 for all of them. You can see all these pictures has 1024 in them. You can confirm by clicking on any of them to see what that looks like on the browser. This is the bathroom. Okay. Okay. That's good. So, and this is what this was the bathroom that was uh, extracted from there. Good. Now, once that is done, the, the next thing we want to do is now uh, extract the property information. So all these other informations that we need, like the, the pricing, the, the, the EPC rating, the number of bathroom, the number of receptions and stuff like that, we need to, we need to fetch that. Now, before I continue, you might be wondering, so where is the chat GPT coming in 
in this case where is the large language model coming in in this case this is where it's going to be applicable so we don't want to start writing complex regular expressions and stuff like that so chat gpt comes to the rescue so let's quickly see how that goes in this case so to do that you just need to go to platform dot uh, platform dot open ai and you can go to dot com platform dot open ai dot com and you can see something like this uh I don't know is this active yep so you can see this this page here and if you like you can just scroll down to the uh, api section on the left here you can see the api keys if you click on the api keys you see the existing api keys that are here so you just have to do is click on the create new secret key and you can see i have the real estate real estate key so if I have the real estate key and I do create secret key, that should create a new key for us. And I say begin puzzle. So we just need to solve this capture. Maybe we should, we should have used uh, bright data to solve this capture for us. Okay, so the verification is complete and you can see we have our key here. So good. So let's copy the key. I'll just copy that. Uh, this will be deleted after the video. So you don't have to copy that. So I'll just have my uh, open AI into the let's bring open AI into the picture now so let's uh, quickly do the installation pip install open AI and we just installed open AI into our project so we can just bring in uh, open AI so we say uh, just have over here we say from open open AI import open AI good so we can initialize that by having a client to say open AI and initialize it with our key. So our API key is going to be this that we copied. By the way, you need to put this in your config file so you don't commit this directly into the system, okay? Uh, I'll optimize this much later after the video, okay? So maybe I can just move this somewhere here. And uh, so our client is ready, our open AI key is ready, and uh, we can now start creating our function that will extract that for us okay so let's say we want to have uh, an integration here we're going to have dev and we say extract uh, property details so this is where the large language is going to be handy so we say uh, let's say print extracting property details now let's take a pause on this and go back here to fetch what we need to extract from because this is the function that is going to help us extract the data that we want but how do we extract that that's where we are going to where we are going to right now so we have our property details property underscore details we say soup dot uh, select one and uh, in this in this case we are going to have a div with a class of what so let's see what that looks like on our browser. So we are looking for, uh, let's see. So the property details is in the second page in this case. So we don't, uh, we don't need all of these images again. So we are looking for somewhere here. Uh, yeah, something here in this case. So we need to get the, the the information from here which starts from here i just move this down a little bit you can see the highlight so you start from this page at uh, this section of the screen and uh, we can now move into that and extract information from there so this is exactly this block is what we need to extract information from so for us to get that we need to refer to this particular class and uh, that holds these uh, children in this case so that's what we need to extract from so i'll just copy the class name I'll just copy class to the end, copy that and go back into this guy. So I'll just say my class equals to this. And uh, I'll just close that tag. Okay, so that's the class that I'm extracting from. And uh, property details is going to be extract uh, property details and we pass in this particular property details as the input. All right, so once the result is returned, it's going to override that variable so we don't overuse the memory okay so that's what we want to do basically now for us to get that 
it's easy for us to proceed from here because everything is uh, probably uh, in major thing that we need is inside uh, this particular uh, section of the screen. Okay, so let's quickly write our prompt. So we say command is going to be this is going to be our command, and we say uh, you are a data extractor model if that's if something like that exists <laughs> and you have been tasked you have been taxed with extracting information about the apartment apartment for me into json okay so here is the div for the property details okay now this is where we put in our uh, the input which is going to be here so that will be input command in this case input command now once we have that the next thing we want to do is the activity which is going to be the output so this is the final json structure expected so the final json structure that is expected is going to be we have a price in this case is going to be empty uh, we have address the address is going to be empty as well. Anything else that we need from here? We have the price, we need, we have the address, we have the maybe this we already have a title, so there's no need for that. We need the bedroom, the bathroom, the reception, and the EPC rating. So we have the bedroom, the bedrooms. Okay, the bedrooms goes like this. We have the what else do we need? Uh the bathroom, I guess. Bathrooms. Then we need the EPC rating as well, uh, which is the reception, receptions. How many receptions does it have? And we have the tenure, I think, is it not? Yeah, tenure. So we have the, if we can get the EPC rating as well, uh, if you like. So we have the tenure. So we have the tenure in this case. Uh, I think we should get the EPC rating as well. That will be valuable um okay and uh, that's the tenure what else do we need we have time remaining on lease service charge council tax ban so we have time remaining on lease then we have service charge of course we have council tax ban We have the ground rent. Ground rent. What else do we need? Um, ground rent date of next review. We don't really need this, to be honest. This is this is all we need to 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 extract from there. Uh, what else do we need? I think that would be uh, this would be cancel, isn't it? Yeah, this would be everything that we need from there. So we just need to close this JSON from here as well. So and that's. Uh, that's the structure and the command that we need to to get so we just need to format this and pass in the right data into that so we have the input input command is going to be our input that is coming in from the system good and finally we have response which is going to be client dot chat dot uh completions dot create so we need to extract that so which model do we want to use if you are subscribing to the chat gpt4 you can use your gpt4 in this case but um i don't have an active subscription of gpt4 so i'm going to be using gpt5 turbo it's not that brilliant well it's not that uh, wise as uh, gpt4 but yeah it does it gets the job done so let's quickly do that so i'm going to have my model my model is going to be uh, what is that? So I'm going to have GPT uh, 3.5 Turbo. And the messages is going to be equal to. So what I want is the role. I'm, I'm performing the role of a user. OK, and in the user, I have a content that I want to send to the system. So which is the command that I just typed in there. Good. So that's the response that I'm expecting from ChatGPT. Then finally, I have my result, 
uh, maybe I can just put this. Yeah, that's fine. I have my result is going to be response, response, and I'm going to have choices. Choice is zero. Then I can do message dot uh, con content, isn't it? Content. Yeah. Then once that comes back, I'm expecting to see this in JSON format. So yeah, I can now pass this as JSON. So I can have JSON data. It's going to be JSON dot uh, load. So let's load that and we pass in result into that. So we don't have JSON imported. So let's quickly do the import of JSON so we can be able to use this API in, in the system. So we just say import JSON. Okay. Import JSON. Good. We just return JSON underscore data and perfect. So that works just fine for us and uh, we are good to go. So the next thing we want to do basically is uh, see what this looks like by the time we extract that in the property details. So if you go down here, you have the data in the property details sitting there pretty nicely. So what we want to do is do data update. Uh, what else what else can we extract before we yeah we continue on that we have uh, let's see uh, just reduce this a little bit and if you look at the features and description and see full description uh, da, 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 everything here is here yeah, there's, ah, interesting. There's a floor plans and tours here. So we can see how the floor plan looks like. Okay. So let's see if we can extract this floor plan as well. Okay. So we need to probably have a function that helps us to do that. So I'm going to have floor plan. It's going to be extract uh, floor plan. And we're going to pass in our soup into that. So let's create a function that helps us do that. We have dev, uh, but start again, extract floor plan, isn't it? Extract floor plan. Okay, so we pass in our soup into that and we say, we say extracting, extracting floor plan. So our plan is going to be saved into a JSON object and we can say floor plan, floor plan equals to Inside our soup, we are finding something, but we don't know what that is yet. So let's inspect this part. Inspect. So we are looking for we are looking for a data name and, and data test ID called flow plan thumbnail zero. That's what we're looking for in our case. So I'll just copy this. In fact, I'll copy from data test ID here to the end. I'll copy that and go back here just like we did before we're looking for a div that has an attribute of data test id okay data test id and then that has the value of floor plan thumbnail zero that's what we're looking for so if we have a floor plan we can now do extraction of the source okay so we say floor plan underscore source it's going to be floor plan just like this uh we have this uh just uh, this div okay inside this div we have a picture that we can extract the source from and the image as well so we need the source okay so we just say floor plan dot find and we just pass in the picture so we are looking for the picture and we can find the source from there just like that, we find the picture and we extract the source from there and we just get in the source set. Source set, isn't it? Is that correct? Source set, yep, yeah, it's correct. We extract that and we can say if, uh, the plan is going to be floor plan, floor plan, and that will be floor plan source. Uh, we just split that by space. Uh, split that and split the threat record. So that means if we are getting this, we don't need this 480W, we don't need that. We just need to extract that, split this and get the first link from there. That's what we're looking for. Okay, and finally, we just return the plan, which is uh, what has been populated with flow plan. Good. And uh, in here, uh, it's floor, not float, or flutes. <laughs> okay, so our flow plan is, is being extracted right now 
we can just say simple data.update so we can update that with a uh, our floor plan and our property details as well so we will play that update that with a floor plan and data dot update isn't it update and we say our property details good and um, finally we just uh, we print this and see how that goes before we continue the, with the rest part of that system so real estate large language model our proxy browser and the web scraper has been taken care of automatically by bright data thanks to them then we have a python in this case that is taking care of all of this uh, at the same time so this part of the system is going to be tested right now and we proceed to the other part of the system good so let's print this out and see how that looks like okay i just run this save this again i just run this python.min.py okay so navigating to the listing page now okay extracting property details okay there's an error called chat completion has no attribute of source okay that's there must be an error in that case uh let's see what we have it should be choices isn't it choices and then we extract the message and content from there. So yeah, let's run this again. Yeah, it couldn't do that. And by the way, we are extracting from, yeah, we should be good. So let's see how that looks like. So it's navigating to the page again, waiting for search result, navigating to the listing page. Good. What else? uh okay extracting property details are you able to do that excellent and he's able to also um what's what again extracting the floor plan and you can see what this looks like you have the address the title the link the pictures then we have the floor plan let's see how that floor plan looks like perfect and uh, we have the what else do we need here we have the price automatically extracted beautiful bedrooms the bathrooms reception epc rating tenure time remaining on lease service charge <laughs> ax agent we have the council tax band is not concluded and the grand rent is 300 pound good we can successfully say that we've been able to take it, take care of the first part of the architecture the next part is where we con connect this and then by the time we are doing the extraction we are pushing data to kafka and then um, from kafka we have a consumer that is listening for events and writing data to Cassandra. That will be our final result or final location where the data is going to be sitting in. Now, but before we continue, something strikes me and that you might have uh, thought about that as well. Okay, what if there's an error or there's a particular uh, a block on our IP address? Bright data already takes care of this. So if there's a block on our IP address, the, there's a proxy rotator that rotates that but if you want specifically to automatically rotate the ip you can go to their residential proxy i'm going to leave the link in the description below as well and you can change the ip based on the, each request is going to be separate ips each time you, you launch your your request but that's not what we are looking for in this case we just automatically uh rotate the ips if anything gets banned or we couldn't proceed on our web scraping okay so let's continue on that okay so back to our code section we've been able to extract the floor plan and property information and everything is working just fine as expected now will be a good time to set up our architecture and uh, bring things to life all right so what i'm going to do basically is uh, create a docker compose that's going to help us do that so we're going to have uh, touch docker compose.yaml and in our docker compose.yaml we are going to have our architecture set up in this uh, case for that so we're going to have uh let's quickly do that we are going to have a version and the version is going to be version 3 well and we're going to have our services that are going to be used so we're going to have the zookeeper we're going to have what else do we need we need to we need kafka we need our control center and we have our master work architecture as well as Cassandra. Okay. So Zookeeper, we have our Kafka broker. 
we have what else uh, we have control center control center we have uh, master worker architecture in this case so we have the spark master and we have the spark worker and then finally we have cassandra good so these are the six services that we need in our system now i'm going to just uh, for each of these services i'm going to copy paste the architecture in this case so we don't make any error that's going to delay the the video at any time okay i'll just copy that and in here in our zookeeper this is going to be the image so let me quickly talk about the zookeeper zookeeper is in charge of managing the services and the brokers that are going to be connected to it so if you have as many kafka brokers as possible zookeeper can easily control that for you so the zookeeper is having an image from confluence uh, inc and is using the zp uh, cp zookeeper with a uh, 7.5 version the host name is zk the container name is zk and we're export exposing the 2181 which is the default port for zookeeper then in the environment variable we are setting the port and the take time to 2181 and 2000 this is the else check to see if zookeeper is alive and ready to accept connections before any before any other services that is going to be dependent on them uh on it breaks up okay so that would be the setup for our zookeeper so this is entirely optional is because we want to make sure that any other service that is dependent on zookeeper uh, only gets triggered or gets initialized after zookeeper is ready to accept and okay all right so let's do the same for our kafka so our kafka is going to come in into the into the picture and we just have in a zook uh, kafka broker i'll just uh, maybe reduce this a little bit and in our kafka broker we have our confluence cp server as our as our broker and uh, the name is going to be kafka broker the host name and the container name as well so this is where the dependency comes in so we are depending on zookeeper on the condition of service ld so if we don't have if we want to have service ld condition then you must have a health check in this case so the port for uh, kafka broker is 1992 and we're also exposing 1991 and 901101 uh, that would be the jmx port all right so we are connecting to zookeeper on zk2181 and we are exposing uh we are using this listener protocol of plain text host and this and that for the advertised listener we are, we are advertising on kafka broker 2902 as well as uh localhost 9092 so this is what we're exposing to the outside world and internally we can use this as well all right the rest is just metrics information and we are getting the schema registry which we don't need right now so we can remove the schema registry from there so the bootstrap server for the metrics reporter is the same thing here and the rest is just uh, the replica everything is replica in this case all right okay so that's that for the uh kafka broker the next one is the control center which is where we are going to be visualizing what is going on on our broker on our kafka broker okay so we have uh the control center in our case we have the same thing host name and, and container name is also dependent on kafka broker on the service ld condition uh, the same way this also does for zookeeper and this is exposing 1921 and uh, we have the bootstrap server of course the replication factors as well we don't need to ex 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 uh, ex uh, enable <laughs> we don't need to enable the metrics is because i wanted to type so yeah, we don't need to enable the metrics in this case, so we turn it to false. So our port is 1921 and it's on this network. Maybe I just move this a little bit down there. Good. Now we are left with a Spark Master Worker architecture. So they're going to be the same. So let's get in our, our Spark Master. So the Spark Master is going to have this and it's going to be inheriting from Spark Common, which we don't have right now. So let's get in our Spark Common into the picture the reason for this is not is to make sure we don't repeat ourselves too much so we have the bit naming the volumes uh everything in this case uh rep replicated multiple times so we don't have to 
do that because we are going to have a single master and four workers that are going to be connected together. So imagine having to repeat the same line of code for the master, then for all of the workers at the same time. That's going to be daunting and repetitive. So we don't want something like that. So that's our master taken care of. We need to do the same for our workers as well. So um, in our master, we have uh, this, this for the master. The same thing will be replicated for the worker, except that uh, it has additional information here, which could be a worker. So we can get in our worker into the picture here. So if you want to have multiple workers, you can actually name this as well, just like you named the uh, the Spark common, we can name this as our workers as well. Uh, this will be Spark worker, and we, we name this as Spark worker uh, image, maybe image, yeah? Then if you want to have another worker, that would be, we can we can just easily say uh, Spark worker one, or maybe worker two in this case, is going to be inheriting from, uh, is going to be inheriting from Spark worker image. I hope that makes sense. So what this means, all these properties that is here is going to be replicated for Spark Worker 2. And if we have additional worker, which is Spark Worker 3 in this case, so we are going to be using the same worker image. So we don't have to replic replicate the same thing over and over for the workers and the master in this case. Yeah, I hope that clears it up a little bit. So the worker is dependent on the master and it's having the core of two gig, uh, two cores and one gig uh, memory. So we have worker two and worker three. So in our case, we have three workers and a single master that are connected together. So if you want to add additional workers, you can actually uh, add as many workers as possible. Okay. So finally, we need to get in our picture, uh, our image for Cassandra. So our Cassandra DB is going to be uh, Cassandra image of latest the container name is cassandra the host name is cassandra we are exposing 1942 as the cassandra port and we are setting the environment with this and the username and password as cassandra cassandra and that will be all for that so finally let's get in our networks and the network is going to be data mastery lab okay and that should be everything on our architecture level Okay, so let's test this and uh, take this for a spin. So we say docker compose up detached and see if everything works just fine. And uh, let's see. Okay, so our zookeeper is up. Okay, zookeeper is waiting. Uh, okay, it's because, I think it's because I scrolled up. Yeah, that messed it up a little bit. But you can see the, the images that are getting created in this case. If you drill this down, why can't I just click on this? Yeah, you see the zookeeper is up and running. Our Kafka broker is up as well. You can see we have master worker in here. Our master is up and our workers are also up as well. So we are waiting for the control center to get created. I think it's waiting on the broker for the initialization to be complete. Once that is done, the broker gets started three seconds ago, exactly. As expected, everything is working just fine. And you can see in our worker, worker is having a uh, Vietnami. And you can see we have successfully sp started service of Spark Worker and 4107. So you can check that as well on the UI on our master. If you look at the 9090 in this case, uh, that will bring up the, the dashboard for our spark master and you can see the three connected workers which are having two cores each and a one gig memory that is attached to each of them they don't have any application running and there is no completed application good so everything is having a three gig total and six six cores uh for that is shared among the three workers this is good so we can continue and start pushing data into a kafka but why we do that i think to reduce the back and forth, I would say, since we already know the structure of our data, we can easily get our Spark worker to listen for this information uh, while we do that. So let's get in our consumer and we can get in our producer as well. So before we do the consumer, let's get in our producer, which is going to be what will be producing data into Kafka. The easiest package that I can think of 
is Kafka Python. Okay, Kafka Python. Okay, so yeah, uh, Kafka Python is installed and we can just import uh, Kafka into the picture. Going back here, we just say uh, import, uh, sorry, from Kafka, import Kafka producer, and we can get in our producer to produce uh, data and records for us. Um, what do we have here? Uh, we have our main. I think we should plug in our producer here. It should be outside of the function. So we have Kafka producer, and that will be our bootstrap server, bootstrap uh, servers, isn't it? Bootstrap, yep, it is. So we have our local host, and then the port of 1992, then the maximum blocks are uh, max block milliseconds. That's the maximum block time. You can check the documentation for the details of uh, that. So in our run, we are passing playwright into our run function. So let's pass in our producer into the picture. So we, we don't have a single uh, parameter anymore. We have two parameters, which is our producer as well as the playwright. All right, producer comes in here. Good. Finally, in this part of the world where we are we are done with the update and we have a singular object that has uh, all the information that we need, we need to have a print sending data to Kafka. And we can say producer.send and we are sending uh, properties. Okay, we're sending properties and the value is going to be json.doms okay and we are dumping that as data we can encode this as utf8 as well okay utf8 good and then finally we just say print uh data sent to kafka bravo and uh, we don't need this anymore we can do that uh we don't need that so yeah i think this is all we need to do to send data to Kafka. So, but before we do that, because if we send right now, the data is already go will be going to Kafka, but we need a listener that is going to be listening and consuming that automatically. So we don't duplicate the effort of, you know, clearing our Kafka broker each time we want to do that. Okay, so let's do that. So we have, uh, we need to have another one. So we say touch uh, spark consumer.py. So this is going to be our consumer, and this is where the code is going to be sitting mm -hmm. in. So we just bring in our PySpark, pip install, PySpark, okay? So let's import, uh, maybe we use login in this case. We can use login before as well. So, I mean, I just realized that we didn't use them before. So from Cassandra, uh, yeah, we need the Cassandra as well, because we are going to be connecting our Cassandra's our sync, is it not? So we have... Uh, yeah, we just clear this up. Pip install Cassandra driver. Okay, so we just install Cassandra driver, and uh, we just say from Cassandra dot cluster we import our cluster because we're going to be needing a cluster that has been set up on our Docker compose. Then we we import our PySpark as well. PySpark dot SQL import Spark session. So we can continue. So we can have an entry point. If the name is going to be main, of course, if the name is exactly main, so we can have this as our entry point. Well, by the way, if you're asking, this is not, uh, you don't have to do this. So it's just like uh, to make things a little bit fancy and have an entry point, okay? So let's create a function called main. So dev main, in our main function, what do we want to have? So we are going to have two things in there, connecting to Kafka and writing to Cassandra. Those are the two major things that we're going to be doing. But in between that, we can do a lot of things like aggregations, you know, windowing, tumbling and stuff like that. As many things, uh, window tumbling as, well, as much as possible. Any other thing that we want to do can be done in between these things. But the first thing we want to do is connect to Kafka and fetch information from there and then write the information that we get into Cassandra. Okay, so let's do that. And uh, in our login, so let's initialize our login if we are going to be using that we have uh, the level is going to be info so we have login.info 
So we have Spark. It's going to be a Spark session that we just brought into the picture. We have our builder. Then the app name is going to be Spark Consumer. Spark is you know Spark consu Consumer. Okay. And uh, in our Spark Consumer, we're going to have a couple of configurations. So which is our Spark Cassandra host. We have our Spark dot cassandra dot connection dot host uh as i said this could be somewhere you put in your configuration so you don't commit it into this all right so i'm going to have another configuration where we have our jazz so spark dot jazz dot packages and that would be our packages here so to get our packages we need two packages one for cassandra and the other one for our Kafka. So to do that, we go to Marvin repository. So we have Spark Cassandra connector in here. So we just get in the 3.4.1. Uh, because I'm using PySpark. Oh, by the way, I didn't show you that. So PySpark version gives me 3.5, which is my Spark version. So in case you want to get the drivers that are going to be compatible with Spark version. So make sure the Spark version that is compatible with the jazz that you're bringing into the picture. So I've tested this as 3.4.1 and it's working as expected. So I just need to bring this in, com.datastacks.spark. I just bring that into the picture here, full column. I get in my artifact ID as well, copy that and uh, paste that in here. And then another full column, then I'm going to have 3.4.1 finally as my version. And that is taken care of. The second part is going to be my SQL Kafka. So I'll just come in here, Spark SQL Kafka, and I can search for that. And um, I'm, I have the Spark SQL Kafka 010, which is this one that I need. And I'm going to be looking for the 3.4.1 as well. So I copy the same thing for that. Uh, Apache Spark, copy that, put that in here, full column. Then the artifact ID, I copy this, paste that in there, full column. And then finally, 3.4.1. Good. And I paste it in there. So those are the two things that I need as my major things. All right. Finally, I just do get or create. So I can create uh, my Spark consumer. In fact, just change this to real estate, real estate Spark consumer. Maybe real estate consumer sound fancier. I'll just leave it at that. So I just have Kafka DF. It's going to be uh, my Spark dot read stream. So I'm reading from Kafka now. So I'm reading from the format of Kafka. And uh, once I have the format of Kafka, I need to pass in the option to recognize which Kafka I'm pulling data from. So I'm having Kafka dot bootstrap dot servers. And in this case, I'm going to have local host 1992 then i'm going to have the option another option in this case which to subscribe so which part am i subscribing to now this is a little bit tricky you can subscribe each time you want to run from the offset which is the earliest offset which is offset zero or you you continue from where you stop either way you need to be able to understand which point you stopped from in case there's an error in the spark script and some part of the data has been uh, has been processed so you don't process everything all over again so we need to go back in here and i'm um, subscribing to the topic of uh, properties at what point am i subscribing to it so i'm subscribing to the starting offset 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 starting offset yeah then the, i'm subscribing to the earliest now i'm subscribing to the earliest because I don't care whether the data is uh, loaded multiple times or processed multiple times. Even though I'm going to prevent that with something like checkpoint, I can do that with that so, so I don't reprocess multiple times. So it will be important to understand uh, the point you are, at which you are pulling data, which offset you are pulling data from. Otherwise, you are going to be reprocessing data every now and again, and you, it may lead to duplication. So yeah, so that is taken care of. Now, the next thing we want to do is getting our structure, the schema structure. I'll just quickly copy the schema structure into the picture and then uh, we can have our schema structure here. So this is our schema structure. I'll bring this in and I'll quickly talk through this so it doesn't seem alien. 
Our struct type is having a struct feed of, of price, title, link, pictures. And if you look at what we have, uh, do we still have it? I think I cleared it up. Okay, yeah. It's going to have bathroom reception. I think another thing we added to this is EPC rating, which we are going to check very shortly. Uh, we can do that before sending this to Kafka. We just break this up and uh, Python main.py. So we can just get this on the side and we can see that. I, I don't want to miss any part of the keys. Um, yeah, connected to the Zoopla now. And the scraping. Okay. Uh, can we navigate to London, please? Okay. Awaiting, waiting, waiting. Yeah, it looks like our IP has been banned. So I can expect a reload of an ad, another IP and maybe it will be used. So I'll just stop this clear this up and uh, run this again and let's see we're connected again and we should be using a fresh ip now i believe okay uh so let's navigate please pretty please yeah yeah the next one is to waiting for search results okay so we are navigating now Okay, so waiting for search results, navigating to the next page. Okay, and um, extracting property details and beautiful. And you can see we have another key called EPC rating in here. So we can go back to our consumer and also fix that as well. So we just uh, import that array type of pictures, pick that in. Then after the receptions, we just bring in uh, Let's duplicate that and we have EPC rating. Just copy that and uh, paste that in here. EPC rating and that will be string as well. Any other thing? Tenure, time remaining on lease, service charge, cancel, tax band, and finally ground rent. Good. So all these things have been uh, brought into the picture. Now, this is where. Uh, you have the freedom to do whatever it is you want in terms of transformation. So if, if you want to convert maybe uh, the numbers to uh, the, the strings to, to floating or decimal or number or something like that, all those kind of transformations can be done. You can also do some lookups to get the latitude and the longitude, some address information as much as possible that are going to be joining, in for, uh, that are going to be additional records that are going to be joining these records that you are pulling from Kafka. You can do that with user-defined functions, UDF. You can check other videos in this uh, channel or just up there where you see some suggestions, uh, you know, pointing you to some of the videos that has the UDF in them. So you can do some additional and complex information, a complex transformation on this particular data that are not going to be discussed here. So you can always, you know, do that yourself or you know leverage additional resources on that so after this we're going to go now and uh, brought once we've brought this in the next thing will be to to just uh, write this and sync it up into um we we'll sync this into our uh, cassandra uh, for for writing and storage okay so we have our kafka data frame that is bring that is brought into the system so we have a select expression so we can do a select expression as cast value. We cast a value as a string. Once we cast the value as string, we cast that as a value. So we cast value as string, then as we call it the name uh, as value. All right. So basically uh, we can put this in. A, yeah. So we don't have the, we don't have to put in the, the backslash at the end of each line. We kind of annoying. So I'm having from JSON. So we just extract the data from JSON here. So let's bring in from JSON. That will be from uh, SQL functions. Yeah. So that will be my from JSON. And then I bring in call as well from the functions. So PySpark SQL functions. Good. Then I just call the column name value. 
And once I, I do that, I pass in the schema so I can enforce the schema on that particular data that is coming in. And I just alias this as a data. Eventually, I can do a select. And I'm selecting data dot asterisk. So I'm selecting everything in that data uh, table. Uh, so I'll ask this as data. Good. And that would be my Kafka DF overwritten. So I can have Kafka. Uh, that's a query. This is where I'm writing to Cassandra. Cassandra, qu Cassandra <laughs> query is going to be. Um, we're going to be writing this as a stream. So we have Kafka DF dot write stream, write stream. And we're writing this. Um, let's see, write stream. Do we have any functions? Yeah, we do dot uh, for each, yeah, for each batch. So we're going to be writing this as a batch. So for each batch, what do we want to do? We want to get each batch as a role. So Lambda, so I think we are going to say batch uh, data frame. So for each of the batches, it could be one record. It could be as many records as possible in a single batch. So what we want to do is get this batch and then write them into Cassandra, each batch, batch by batch. Okay. So we do uh, for the batch ID, we extract the batch, batch ID, if I can really type batch ID. So we have a batch data frame. And then for each of the records in there, okay, um, yeah, we have lam lambda batch batch data frame then we ex we get that as a batch id uh, of course batch data frame and batch id then for each of the batch data frame we loop that and then for each of the lambda row so we get each record and we do insert data which are going to be using cassandra connection uh Cassan cassandra connection or oh, maybe cassandra session i'll say cassandra session okay and I'm going to be getting the row as dictionary. Okay, I know this is a little bit somehow. I mean, the, the syntax looks somehow as well. But let me just explain what I what I'm trying to do here. So I'll just pull this on the same line, and we can yeah, this could be like that. So what I'm doing is I have my Kafka data frame, and I'm writing stream. So the write stream function on each of them, I'm saying for each of the batches get the data frame and get the batch id which are going to see shortly now for each of the batch i'm looping through that and say each of the row inside this row using cassandra session and we're going to create these two functions and we're converting this row as a dictionary so we have key value pair just like this just like this we're sending that into insert data and using cassandra session for that so let's create a cassandra session that will be used for this okay so just above here, I'm going to have dev uh, Cassandra, Cassandra session. Maybe I call this create Cassandra session. And this would be session is going to be cluster that we brought in earlier. So that will be our Cassandra cluster, this guy. Okay. So I'm bringing in the local host as our local host by default, the port is going to be automatically attached to that. So we just say connect. So once we connect to that, we don't need this. So if there's a session, if session, okay, is not known. So that means we are able to successfully connect to Cassandra. We need to do two things, create a key space and create a table. So we say create key space and with the session and we say create table uh, with the session as well. Okay. So these are the two things that we need to do in this case. So for the, for the key space, maybe we don't need to have a separate function, but well, we could have that. So to make things a little bit modularized. So we say create key space. Well, in your case, you may not want to do that. If you like, you can, or you can do it. It doesn't really matter. So we have session.execute. You can just put everything in the same line and you'll be good to go. All right. So session.execute, so I'm going to have create key space. And in this key space, if it does not exist, if not exist, so I'll call this uh, properties stream. Maybe property stream. All right. Property streams. Yeah. Property streams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Naming is almost somehow for me. So I have replication. It's going to be. So the replication in this case, I'm going to be using a class 
using the simple strategy simple strategy by default and then the replication factor is going to be one replication factor is going to be one good so what this means basically is i'm creating a key space and the replication factor for this key space is one so i'm not replicating it multiple times or into different streams or into different tables or something like that the simple strategy is what i'm adopting here you can adopt a different strategy depending on how big your use case is going to be like or whatever is suitable for your use case all right so i just say print uh key space uh created successfully okay good and that's my key space the final thing that i need to do in this case is the table so i have my dev create table and i'm passing in the session session as well and uh, i'm going to have session dot execute well if you note something i'm not handling errors or something like that so you might want to do that in your own case okay so create table if not exists all right so that will be property streams copy that dot uh, properties okay and here i'm going to have this closed up Yeah, I just need to specify the primary key. The primary key in my case is going to be the link. So the link is going to be unique across board. All right. And that's all I need to do in my case. So finally, I just need to, yeah, to create the table and uh, print that. So I say print table created successfully. Good. And um, what else? So I have my... Uh, yeah this will be create cassandra session so i need this will be taken care of now we need to have the final thing is my insert data where i insert data into cassandra so i have dev insert data and here i have my session and this will be the quarks that i'm bringing into the picture quarks okay and uh, so this is going to be uh let's see session comma quarks yeah so that will be print inserting data into cassandra maybe just inserting data is fine yeah i know it's cassandra then i'm going to have a session dot execute so i'm inserting this and that would be um insert into property streams which is this i'll just copy that so i don't make mistakes copy this all right and uh, paste that in here Then once I have that, I just insert the quarks.value, quarks.values, okay? And that would be all, and just say print data inserted successfully. And that would be taken care of in my case. Is there any other thing here that I haven't taken care of? Cassandra, it says execute got none instead. What do you mean? Yeah, okay. So I'm um, yeah, I'm doing this. Uh, at the end of the day, for each of the batches, once I do, once I'm done with the batches, I just get in dot start, and that should be okay. And uh, maybe yeah, I just need to get in there and then await termination good um i'm concerned about this what's going on here ah yeah i didn't return so i just say return session oh i was concerned uh, about that as well so yeah good so i'm seeing that in the right color now and i know uh is there any other thing that is uh 
Yeah, just remove that. Any other thing here? Good. So let's now start our our Spark consumer, and we can send this to the jobs, and then the jobs can listen for these uh, events that are happening. Good. So while this is going on, and uh, we can do a Spark submit in my case. Um, so I just clear this up. Hey, um, Spark submits. I'm submitting with the packages of Cassandra as well as SQL Kafka. So these two packages that I have in here, I'm going to be using them when I'm submitting with my packages. So I have Spark submit packages. I have com dot this this guy. 3.4.1 the same thing with apache spark and the kafka as well i'm going to be doing that as well then i'm going to be calling the the spark consumer oh by the way this is going to be running on my local system once this is confirmed okay i'm going to deploy it on the on the docker cluster and we can continue running from there so let's run this and, and see what that looks like so you should be waiting for events on the kafka broker isn't it yeah so that should yeah it says there is no yeah book caps yeah must be specified when configuring kafka consumer bootstrap the servers is that not there yeah it's bootstrap yeah bootstrap dot server you probably saw that uh just going to run this again okay then it should it just, it's just be holding on uh yeah it says it doesn't host this topic partition because the, the topic does not exist in the system yet. So let's do that. And uh, we, co we comment this out and enable this so we can start sending data into Kafka. Okay. So we just have Python main.py here. And in our next, uh, in our next uh, tab, I'm going to have a Spark submit to submit that. And that should be sending data to Kafka. So it's uh, navigating to Zooplanner, and we wait a few seconds uh, for that to be done. Oh, by the way, while this is going on, and uh, we are waiting for the production to start, we can preview this on the terminal as well as on the UI. So if you go to the UI and go to the go to the 1990, this one on our control center. If you go to 1921. You should be able to see the cluster in this case and in the cluster you see the brokers that are available so you have one broker if you go to the brokers and uh, you go to the topics i mean rather topics you see the properties and uh, if you see the properties is there any message produced now yeah you can see data being produced in this case and you can see each of the listing details uh sending records into kafka so i'm going to just run this again and see if we can consume data from Kafka in real time while writing as well to Cassandra. Okay, so you can see, let's see. Yeah, you can see, I think it's writing now. You can see this sync. So it's syncing into this. Uh, do we have anything? Yeah, it's syncing. So let's see what that looks like on the Kafka broker as well as Cassandra. So on the Kafka broker, if you do Kafka topics, and then you try to list and uh, you send him to you send this to the bootstrap servers bootstrap server okay it's broker 9092 uh, i think it's kafka broker isn't it yeah it's kafka broker you can see we have properties here good so that is done so you can actually uh, listen to the Topics here with Kafka console uh, consumer and you pass in the topic. The topic is going to be uh, properties. All right. And then you can start from the beginning if you like, or you just, uh, you just wait for it to start producing. You can see all the records in here. The same thing happens in the messages here. You can see them uh, sitting there pretty nicely. And all of the pictures are pulled into the system. You can see the floor plan 1.2 million and the rest like that. Good. And uh, while this is going on, uh, let's go to our Cassandra as well. Uh, going to Cassandra, we're going to Cassandra, exec SH, so we can 
so we can open up our something like the beaver or you do it on the terminal as well so you can do uh SQ, sql sh sql sh and uh, here we can say select stuff from uh what's the table name again uh we have uh kafka consumer spark consumer what's the name of the table again we have properties streams of properties okay and then maybe limits limits two right we just limit to two records and you can see the two records syncing directly into kafka uh, into into cassandra and if you like you can just get maybe the name uh, the title or something like that so you can say select um we're selecting the the price title link and uh maybe the, the 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 floor plan or something like that just something like this and you can see for them if you don't limit now it should be a little bit yeah cleaner you can see the data coming in directly from there and uh yeah 22 records are here now 23 and data is being uh, inserted in real time into Cassandra. Yep. And uh, yeah, you can see that it's syncing that it's, it's been idle. So there are no additional records. So the production has stopped and uh, everything is done right now. I think it's list going to the next page. Yeah, it's still going on. Yeah, to listing page. Yeah. So this is waiting for an uh, activity to be done and uh, what else if i run this again yeah we still have 23 records so yeah i think that's the last page in this case uh the last page which is the last one here and i'm able to fetch uh, 23 records so it's easy for me to easily decide uh which one to get information from and uh, here i'm verifying that i'm human being the good thing is these records are this uh the 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 cloudflare challenge are being automatically resolved by bright data so if you are doing that manually with something like request or something like uh maybe you are doing web scripting with some be scrappy or other things you'll have to write your module that's going to be handling the challenges because that's why something like that exists in the first place to prevent or limit the people that are web scraping so but bright data allows you um you know unblocks that particular level and gives you access to the to the right data without having to worry about you know having additional uh, modules and stuff like that so while that is done it looks like uh, if you look at our architecture based on what we've done so far we've been able to uh, extract information the real estate information from zoopla and using a uh, large language model something like chat gpt in our case we are using the bright uh, web bright data web scraper that uses the proxy manager gets the targeting ip controls and rules all these things in play in the web scraper using python to stream data into kafka that is managed by zookeeper and we can visualize that on the control center streaming data from uh, kafka into into cassandra with uh, with uh, the master worker architecture in this case so finally let's now start submitting the job into the docker and we can uh wrap things up from there so the two things we need to do here because we are running on our local system so most of the jobs are going to be localized right because i'm going to be connecting to the docker instances right so i'm using the local host as my uh network all right that's the local host the 127 and i'm connecting to the port of the spark cluster from my local system, right? Uh, if you look at the Spark cluster just here, uh, what I have is I'm connecting to the Kafka on localhost 1992. So when I'm in the container, that is going to change and that is going to change to Kafka broker. So I can still leave it at 1992 or change it to 29092. That's the internal IP. That is uh, written in the, if you look at the Kafka here, I can, I can use that which is the advertised listener so i can use this kafka broker 29092 on the container or i can leave it as uh, 9092 whichever one should work just fine for me so i'm going to just move this into jobs 
once I move that into jobs, I uh, should be able to see everything in there. So um, that's that's uh, now in my Spark cluster. So I can submit from there. But what I need to do basically while that is going on is to change this. I'm going to change this to Kafka Broker. Kafka Broker 9092, I'll leave it at that. And uh, any other thing here? Yeah. Everything is, should be fine. Okay, so yeah, I just do docker exec, docker exec. I'm going to be exec in, uh, executing into the interactive terminal of what's the name of this uh, broker. Before that, I need to do docker ps. Um, if you do docker ps, you should be able to get the actual name of your Spark master. Okay, so that's where I'm submitting the jobs to. So if I copy this, uh, just do docker exec, and I say exec it, and I'm submitting to this. So all I need to do is pass in the packages, just like before, packages, and I'm going to be sending the packages that are here. Uh, where are the packages? Yeah, I'll just copy these packages, comma. Okay, copy that, paste it in here, and then copy this as well copy this into that and i need to find a location where the data is sitting in and you can get that by coming into the master here into the files or you you go into this and if you do ls you can see you have the jobs if you do ls jobs you can see your spark consumer here so if you go into jobs jobs and you say pwd you see it's inside the opt bitnami spark jobs but the home directory is opt bitnami spark all right so you can just say jobs forward slash uh, spark consumer so i just do jobs forward slash spark consumer.py good so that should automatically if everything is fine should automatically submit that into that so i can see it says docker exec it it says packages oh yeah so uh, that should not be that. I should just add uh, the Spark submit. So I'm just, I'm going to be having Spark submit in there, and that should fix it for me. And you can see submitting the jobs. Okay, good. So this is going on, and it says no module name Cassandra. Of course, and the reason for this is simple. The reason for this is simple. When we initialized our Spark containers, we didn't install all of these dependencies and modules. So the way to do that is to automatically do that with something like a requirement.txt that you can pull into the system. But what I'm going to do basically is to export my requirement.txt, put it in the jobs and run it manually. So you can do that in the startup command for your master worker architecture, but I'm not going to do that. I'll just export that into the requirement.txt and just run that. I don't want to shut this uh, Docker container down. Okay, so let's do that. So I just have pip freeze requirement.txt and you can see the data in here. Uh, requirements the requirements in here so you can see all of the requirements that are, are installed here so i'll just uh, move this into my jobs okay if i move it into the jobs so i just need to go into this guy and i do ls so i do pip install requirements requirements dot txt okay and it's going to install all of the dependencies for me and I do the same for the workers as well. I just do pip install our jobs requirements.txt. Yep. Just copy this, run that, and that should be going on. I do the same for the worker three. Uh, like I said, you can do this automatically with the Docker Compose, so you don't have to do this. I'm just too lazy to, <laughs> to go back to the Docker Compose and, and do that. Okay, so yeah, that should be that should be fine once the installation is done and we should be good. 
Okay, so it's still installing. All right, so it's adding them. It's already installed, 100%. So we do the same for the worker, and you can see everything is 100% installed. So if you do uh, the submission again, it should be good, and there should no there should be no errors. Okay, and uh, there's an error here. It says you couldn't find something here. You couldn't find in the consumer. It says Spark consumer line one twelve, one twelve. So it's trying to load that. Does load in line seventy eight. So it's trying to load this. So it couldn't it couldn't recognize the Kafka broker on this are they on the same network let's check that are they on the same networks they are there let me just double check that everybody's on the same network okay good so what we can do basically is to fix this part uh to fix that we just need to ensure where are you so it's trying to load the data from kafka broker here but it couldn't do that so let's see why we couldn't do that. Uh, we do the name. The name of the container is uh, uh, Docker PS. You can see uh, here we have what's the name again? Our Kafka broker. It's called Kafka broker. That's right. And it's uh, connecting on nine zero nine two. Yeah, I'm just having Kafka broker here as two nine zero nine two, and uh, I'll try to submit it again. Okay, so it's still the same error. And it's it's trying to load that, but it couldn't do that. Uh, I couldn't couldn't load that. So we have a problem here. And the problem that we have is because of the incompatibility of the driver versions that we are running across the Docker container and on my local system. You can see that everything works just fine when I do Spark submit on my local system. But anytime I try to submit on the cluster, which is my, my, my Docker cluster, I run into issues. Now, let me show you what the issue is in this case, in case you run into the same issue and now you're going to fix it. Now, if you look at this, what we have right now is showing us something like this. And you can see, um, yeah, it's trying to load something here, but you couldn't do that. And you can see the error is because of no class there found, scalar less column, uh, colon less, right? So what you want to do basically is you want to go to your Docker and in the master, if you go to the exec section and you try to do Spark submit, can I clear this up? Uh, clear, okay, we don't do that. So I just do Spark submit and I do version. If you look at the Spark submit version that I have in here, I have Spark submit version of 3.5.1. And on my local system, when I was running this, I have Spark Submit version. If you look at the version that I have in here on my local system, it's 3.50. It doesn't look that different because of it's just a patch, 3.50, 3.51, right? But that really messed up the dependency. And that's why you are seeing the Scala colon less colon whatever, whatever. All right, to fix that is a simple thing. We have to either do two things. Either we increase the, or we find a way to fix the driver libraries, or we downgrade the, uh, the, the Docker versions of the images that we're using in our Spark master work architecture. I prefer the later option where I just downgrade the, the Spark version to 3.5.0 and I don't have to change my libraries. So let's do that. So I'm just going to go back here and I'm just going to select my master worker architecture here for the master worker architecture and delete them. So once I delete them, I'm just going to go back into the Docker Compose and instead of using the latest, I'm going to use 3.5.0 as my version because that's the version that I'm running on my local system. Okay, all I just have to do is Docker Compose up detached mode and this is going to spin up the 3.5 version of the same docker instance or of the same docker image the master worker architecture image that i have for the 3.5.1 version it's going to be done for 3.5.0 right and that's exactly what i want so don't forget 
we are not running the requirement.txt directly from the Docker Compose. That's lazy of me, I know, but you have to just run the installation on each of them on the cluster that you have. Okay, so yeah, if you look at what I have in here, if I go to the master and I do pip install, pip install our jobs requirements, requirements.txt, and I run this, I just copy this. Okay, uh, just copy this. And I go to the first worker and run this there. Go to the second worker, run that there. Go to the last worker and run it there as well. I believe those ones will be automatically fixed as well. So what you want to do now is you want to go to your Spark consumer, all right? You want to go into the Spark consumer and in the drivers that you imported, you want to change from where are the drivers? Where are you? Okay, so I just delete. Yeah, you just delete 13 and change it to 12. In this case, just downgrade the library to 12. Then finally, you just save that. Then in the submission script, when you are doing Spark submit, so you change that from 13 to 12 as well. So you have Spark SQL Kafka 212. 341 for 3.50 when you are submitting to the cluster on docker and by the way you just add the master okay the master here to that and that's the master just copy that from here just copy that from here and uh, try to use that to submit okay and by now the building should be done for the workers so let's check them to see if everything is working just fine Okay, so this is still building. All right. It's taking way too long than expected. Yeah, that's, this is done. Good. So now we can submit. With the downgraded versions of the jars, we can submit the cluster now. And don't forget, I'm doing an execution into interactive terminal of the Spark Master 1. All right. So I'm doing a Spark submit to the master. So it doesn't matter whether you submit through the worker one two or three or the master itself so what matters is it has a master flag so this is going to be submitted to the master regardless and the job is going to be running to completion and don't forget the line 75 in this case is very important where you change this to the kafka broker and the internal ip you could use uh, the 9092 it doesn't matter but you know you just change this container name to Kafka broker, not localhost. When you are on the on the cluster, the the Docker container cluster. Okay. We we'll just wait a few seconds for this to be done, and we wait and see what's going on with it. Okay, so it's now running. The error is gone and you can see that the executor app is now running and you have one zero and two for the workers and they are all active so if you check on the ui now and you do a refresh so instead of 3.5.1 you should see 3.5.0 the downgraded version of this uh the uh the spark master worker architecture that has just been uh, downgraded to 3.500 okay so this is still running and you can see that is still running here as well. So what we can do basically is uh, we can try to run the main.py again. So we can start uh, running the jazz again. I'll just stop this and I'll just say python main.py. Oh, by the way, so instead of that, uh, instead of London, so let's change that to uh, maybe Northampton. 
north arm chain okay so we are no longer in london we are trying to find a house in northampton and if you run this again now we'll be we'll be crawling from north arm Okay, so by the way, you can also connect to the cluster with the beaver. So I'll just bring up my the beaver. And uh, we can connect to the cluster. And uh, here, I just need to create a new connection. Here, I just type in Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra. And this is Cassandra coming here. It's uh, coming here from localhost. And the key space is... Uh, property streams all right and i'm connecting with a database native of cassandra 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 all right and i can test this out to see if my connection is uh, working as expected and uh, connected so if i finish this and connect to that uh, you can see my property streams here and you can see the key spaces here and uh, you can see the tables in the key spaces uh, tables right now i have a single table which you can see the the data in there and uh, you can see the data uh, this is 23 records in here and everything is from i believe london everything is london here and by the by the time this is done let's see we should be able to okay so there's an error somewhere here so it's trying to connect to cassandra it couldn't do that because i'm using localhost for cassandra as well so we need to change that from localhost uh where's cassandra in our cluster our cassandra cluster and the spark consumer so we are using the local host so we change the name to cassandra name so in our case the name the container name for cassandra is what the container name is cassandra all right i just copy that and in my spark consumer i need to update that to cassandra as well all right and save that so this can stop running and I can resubmit. I just have to resubmit that. Oh, by the way, I need to change this as well from localhost to Cassandra. And I need to run that again. Okay, so it's running again. And it's resubmitting that. If I refresh this, this should be completed now with errors. Okay, it's finished in five minutes. And uh, yeah, this is running again. Yeah, you can see the sync is now is now syncing new records into Cassandra. So if I do a refresh now, I just re re right click there and just re refresh. Okay, if I do a refresh, you can see additional records in here, and um, this is uh, this is these are new records that are coming in, and these are from nothing. Uh, you can see Northampton. These are the additional records that are coming from Northampton. So while that is running, uh, if I if I trigger another process and I'm pulling data from, let's say, um, let's say I'm pulling from Manchester, Manchester, okay, and I run this again for Manchester. 
if I run this for Manchester and I'm pulling, uh, sending new records to Kafka from Manchester. So let's see how that looks like in Manchester. So Manchester is pulling new records and this guy is waiting. You can see it's waiting for in the next 10, in 10 seconds, there are no additional records pulled in. So it's waiting for new records to come into the streams. Right, waiting for search results, good. And uh, yeah, navigating to the first listing page. And yeah, you should be able to pull that. Extracting property details. Uh, okay, it's sent to Kafka. And you can see this guy is picking it up. It's no longer I do, so he's now picking it up. If I come back here and do a refresh again, you should be able to see that I have new records. Uh, this is uh, just to another refresh. Yeah, you can see it's coming in, uh, but this is London. I don't think it's uh, ordering this by anything. Yeah, it's not ordering it. So yeah, it's not being ordered. So, but additional records should be coming in. This is 53 records. So that means the additional records that are coming in. So maybe you can have some date into that and, uh, you know, you can see additional records. So I'm trying to see if I can see Manchester here. You can see Manchester. So it's not ordering it by date or something or by link or whatever, I think. So it's just, uh, you can see Manchester coming in to the picture here. So um, additional records are coming in to Manchester as well. So yeah, so that is uh, so that is still streaming by the way on the side, and uh, additional records as they are coming in are, are being pushed to Kafka directly from here and then being consumed uh, using our purchase pack. Now, basically, if you look at our architecture, we've really satisfied the architecture end to end. So we we started with a uh, real estate. Uh, you know, website, which is Zoopla. We got data from there and using chat GPT as well and the proxy manager and web, uh, bright data web scraper, we were able to automatically, uh, resolve the, the data pooling from, uh, Zoopla using our Python code and pushing and streaming that into Kafka that is managed by Zookeeper. You can visualize it on the control center, or if you like on the terminal, then each event that is coming into Kafka is being listened to by Kafka, uh, by Spark Master Worker Architecture that is writing data directly, listening to events on Kafka and writing data directly to Cassandra. Now you can take it off from here, maybe have some additional columns like uh, created date uh, timestamp or something like that as much as possible do you have the the autonomy to to make sure but regardless of that you make sure you don't uh you know you make sure as much as possible you don't overweigh uh the zoopla uh website as much as possible try to be reasonable when you are web scraping and you know make sure that everything you are pulling from there is uh is just for educational purposes all right thank you very much for watching and um, I'm going to be seeing you in the next video. Don't forget, the link in the description is going to give you $10 that you can use to practice on Bright Data. So don't forget to use the link in the description for additional $10, uh, $10 that you can use to start your journey on Bright Data. And uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.